Hello, and welcome to Independent Thinking, the weekly podcast from Chatham House. I'm Leslie Vinjamori. I direct the U.S. and America's program here at Chatham House, and today I'm sitting in for Brahman Maddox, who is away this week. On the podcast this week, we'll be looking at the outcome of the final round of Turkey's presidential election. Despite the polls, which showed him behind, and amid a devastating earthquake and an economy in crisis, President Erdogan was re-elected, winning by 52% of the vote to 48% for the opposition. In our last episode, we looked at what Erdogan's re-election might mean for Turkey's democracy and for its economy. This week, we'll be looking at what five more years of Erdogan's foreign policy will mean for Turkey and for the rest of the world. Joining me on today's show to unpack all of these questions is a stellar lineup. We have Gallup DeLay. Gallup is our Chatham House Associate Fellow for the Middle East and North Africa program. Gallup joins us from Istanbul. Welcome to you, Gallup. It's lovely to see you. Nice to be here. Also joining us today down the line from Berlin is Dr. Sinem Adar. Sinem is an associate researcher for the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Welcome, Sinem. Thank you. It's nice to be here. And finally, joining us on the show is Dr. Dmitry Betchev at the University of Oxford School of Global and Area Studies. Welcome, Dmitar. Thank you for having me. So let me begin with with a sort of wide open question. The three of you are deeply expert on Turkey. You've been watching it both in its democracy and its question of human rights, rule of law, and especially Turkey on the global stage, an absolutely critical player for NATO, a country that we're never quite sure where to place because it's placed in in many parts of the globe, not least Asia and Europe. So these elections, I think many people felt would have a very significant importance for Turkey's foreign policy. So what what does this election mean? What does it mean for Turkey's foreign policy? Perhaps we can start with you, Ghali. I think this election is quite important for Turkey's foreign policy, and particularly if the opposition have won, we would probably have seen quite a different Turkey in foreign, in foreign policy terms than we have seen in the previous five or ten years, because the opposition has promised the normalization of Turkey's ties with the Western uh, allies, the normalization of Turkey's place in the Western institution or transatlantic institution. And in contrast, basically, the government is promising the continuation of today, which basically means the quest for grandeur in international affairs, the autonomy in foreign and security policy. The Turkey is basically situating itself, engaging in a geopolitical balancing act between Russia the West on the war in Ukraine, continuing with the normalization policy in the Middle East. So the the but the autonomy in foreign and security policy is the most crucial aspect of the term, of the President Erdogan's foreign policy. So what we will see basically, we will see this to continue. We will see the Turkish Western relationship to remain crisis ridden, but nevertheless the transactionalism and compartmentalization will define this relationship now. The sides will cooperate where their interest dictates, and but the sides will not be shy away from engaging in crises when they uh, when they uh, when they dis- uh, disagree. Sorry, let me let me pause right there, and I want to. We're going to come to a lot of unpack many of these issues that you've raised, and really uh, and get quite concrete about what you mean. Um, but before we do that, let me come to each of you to get your 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 varied views, perhaps. Um, uh, Sinem. Adar, what is your perspective on this? How does this election matter for foreign policy? Is it really uh, demonstrating continuity, but also something very different from what the opposition would have pursued across the board? I think um, should the opposition or if the opposition won the election, foreign policy would probably be one between continuities and ruptures. Um, Ruptures would be mainly in the conduct of foreign policy and in the style. Um, rhetorical style, but the continuity there would be if the opposition won the election. There would still, I think, be continuity in terms of Turkey's aspirations to position itself as a regional power, as well as its aspirations to strike and design an independent foreign policy. So, on, in that department, I wouldn't necessarily see much of a difference between the opposition 
and 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 uh, and the current um, government. Having said that, however, if the opposition won the election, I think Turkey's strategic orientation would be um, more kind of structurally embedded in the West, and in and there would be more investment in the country's relations with its Western allies, which would, in my opinion, I agree with Galeb, would be ridden, conflict ridden in the coming uh, years. So it would be a continuation of the confrontational style when it comes to um, Turkey's Western allies. And I think given that the country will remain unstable, it will be also very difficult to predict um, foreign policy acts of Mr. Erdogan and his government in the coming years. So a more nuanced view. But before we double down on some of these specific issues, let's come to you, Demitar. What is your perspective? Continuity or a very different foreign policy than we might have otherwise seen had the opposition gained power? Well, it's a bit of a moot point now because they're not coming to power and it's all about continuity. But I I definitely agree. Uh, Even on some promises they made, for instance, normalizing relations with Assad, there would have been quite a bit of overlap with it, what we saw on the third one. For instance, Turkey would have been very unlikely to withdraw from those parts of northern Syria. They, they, they're embedded. Another item that we probably see continuity under opposition leadership or Kılıçdaroğlu presidency, Turkey wouldn't have imposed sanctions on, on Russia. Of course, you have much closely aligned position with the West and NATO contribution, but I don't didn't, didn't see at the time an opposition U-turn in policy vis-a-vis Moscow. So these are just two items amongst others. I appreciate your remarks, and you're right that it is a moot point. But one thing we often see after an election is that somebody becomes, you know, in this case, President Erdogan could become emboldened. And so it might not just be continuity. Uh, it might be a different kind of foreign policy, one that's a harder line than, than we had seen before. And I think for those um, both at home and those who are very dependent and looking to Turkey, whether it's on questions of Sweden's accession to NATO, whether it's on questions of the war in Ukraine, that preparing for this has been quite a significant moment. So I'm going to come back to that. But let me take a turn and look very concretely at, of course, one of the most important questions, which is the question of NATO and of Sweden's membership. We've been waiting for this election and waiting to see how Ankara is likely to approach this in the new period. What are your views? Perhaps um, just to mix the order up a little bit, we'll start with you, Sinem. Will Turkey uh, ease its position now and allow that accession to go forward? How is this likely to unfold? Um, I think it's likely that Ankara will eventually approve how soon that eventual comes. That I don't know whether it will come before the NATO summit in July or not. It's hard to tell. I mean, for Turkey, the main obstacle to Sweden's NATO membership is Stockholm's rather loose policy, what Ankara considers as loose policy on Kurdish exiles and refugees affiliated with the Kurdistan Workers' Party that is considered a terrorist group by the US and EU as well as those affiliated with the Gülenist movement that Turkey considers as a terrorist organization. It also wants Sweden to cut its support to YPG in Syria. So Turkey's approval in March for Finland to join NATO was, in my opinion, a way to increase not only legitimacy for its demands, Uh, in the case of Sweden, but also to pressure Stockholm to go ahead with these demands. Ultimately, however, the aim has been to pressure the US towards adopting Turkey's own definition of terror and therefore to stop US's support to YPG in Syria. This didn't happen and will not happen. Um, And if 16 sales that Turkey was demanding from the U.S. might work as a catalyst here, I think, to kind of facilitate Turkey's approval of Sweden's NATO membership bit, yet the Congress doesn't have the full support on that. Moreover, based on President Biden's short description of his most recent call with President Erdogan, um, I think one can say that the U.S. is also seems not willing, at least publicly, tie the F-16 issue to Turkey's approval to Sweden's NATO bid and keep it a little bit hanging as it seems to be an important leverage point. Long story short, I think that will be an approval soon, but how soon that approval comes, that is up in the air. So you've just unpacked um, and and put on the platform multiple issues here, not only uh, Turkey's support or not of Sweden's accession to NATO, but also the question of uh, U.S. relations with Turkey, the F-16s. 
Let me turn to you, Demeter, to get your impression of what are the array of issues that are going to weigh in on Turkey's consideration of Sweden's NATO bid. Will there be a direct linkage to this question of U.S. policy, the F-16s, the definition of terror, or is this just a matter of um, waiting it out? Well, um, at the risk of sounding naive, I think something is in the works, because yesterday we had Anthony Blinken making a statement that he called uh, Mevlut Cavusoglu as well. And also the F-16, these are two different deals. One has been already fulfilled, this modernization. And the second part, which is the transfer of uh, the, the jets, is now in the pipeline. And I see some changes in Congress because one of the leaders of the House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, Representative McCall from Texas, who's Republican, now says that he's open to such a transaction. We are yet to see what Senate says, but it uh, seems that the Biden administration line, let's give the F-16s to Turkey in exchange for Sweden, is happening. Uh, Sweden has fulfilled most of the measures they agreed last year under the memorandum with Turkey and Finland. And finally, I don't think Turkey has so much leverage because Sweden is not a frontline country. It has vast defense capability and potentially it can have bilateral deals with the UK and the US. So it's not that they'll go out of their way to fulfill all the demands that Turkey puts forward. And they've done quite a bit. So tomorrow, apparently, the anti-terrorism legislation is coming into force in Sweden. So there will be at least some excuse for the Turks to make a step forward and they'll have something to show for it. Galip, let's turn to you on this question of President Biden, his phone call with President Erdogan, and the direction of travel in this relationship. Obviously, there have been questions about the S-400s, about the F-16s, and the question of where Sweden's accession to NATO membership, whether that's linked into that broader conversation. Do you agree with what you've just heard from Dimitar, that the, the F-16 deal will go forward, that the U.S. Congress is easing off of its negative pressure on that decision? I think... In a very interesting way, an Erdogan government probably is more likely to approve the Swedish membership being than an opposition government would have been, because simply the Erdogan government has majority in the parliament, because this Swedish membership needs to be approved by the Turkish parliament. So if Erdogan was in opposition, probably they would have put forward quite a strong opposition to the approval of it, and then the opposition not having the majority in the parliament probably would have had harder time to approve it. So in a sense, the moment that Erdogan decides to uh, go forward with the Swedish membership, it can go forward because it has the majority in the parliament. Coming to the uh, US side, the crisis that Turkey is blocking of Swedish NATO membership is not about Sweden. And probably it's not primarily about Sweden. This is reflecting the nature, the future, and the health of Turkish-US relations. Because in the end, let's not forget, in the last NATO summit, it was the Biden administration intervention to get a deal to prevent Turkey's blocking of the process of membership in Madrid summit. And I think we will still need a similar intervention from the US rather than from Sweden to get this to be approved, whether at the upcoming Vilnius summit in July or whether another time, but I'm quite confident that this issue will be resolved in 2023 in one way or another. And then this F-16 package, unfortunately, is part and parcel of it. So if the F-16 issue is not resolved in Turkish-U.S. relationship, the Turkey will procrastinate uh, this process as much as uh, possible. And if F-16 is resolved, Turkey has a very strong narrative to tell because the Sweden's new anti-terror law, which made it more stronger, now is coming into effect on June 1st. So the Turkey has a narrative to tell domestically, F-16. So I think that will basically pave the way for the Swedish membership. But not getting the F-16 or promise of it would probably lead Erdogan uh, and Turkey to delay this process a bit further. And even though the Sweden can have separate deal with uh, with UK and US, but the NATO membership still contains more than the guarantee of UK and US. I think the the elephant in the room right now, and we all know it's there, is the war in Ukraine. There's a question about Turkey's relationship to Russia. There's a question about Turkey's relationship to NATO and to the US. 
And these all, of course, become, um, there's a sort of meeting point, which is how Turkey is positioning itself with respect to Russia and Ukraine. Tell us how, if at all, the election will change. Maybe you can quickly update us on that and tell us how you think the election might change Turkey's positioning. Well, I think the election means the continuation of Turkey's Russia policy and Turkey's Ukraine policy. So what is this policy? I, I have described it in Black Sea, being pro-Ukraine without becoming anti-Russia. Because Turkey definitely would not want a Russian victory in the Black Sea. Turkey is a major Black Sea actor, so a Russian victory in Black Sea, that means the balance of power in the Black Sea, will dramatically shift in favor of Russia. And, and given the history of Turkey-Russia, most of the Turkish-Russian world fall over the Black Sea. So the Turkey does not want this to happen. But then Turkey looks at another level, which is the Russia, the w- Russia Western confrontation dimension. So the Ukraine war, on the Ukraine war per se, Turkey is pro Ukraine without becoming anti Russia. But on Russia and the Western front, it is the geopolitical balancing. So basically, not joining the Western sanctions, not joining the travel, uh, the flight ban on Russia, and at the same time, actually taking advantage of Russian isolation in international affairs, trying to attract the Russian money trying to take the Russian isolation in international affairs in different geopolitical realms, being in, be it in Syria, be it in Libya, be it in Nagorno-Karabakh, that will continue. But I think one thing... That is a difficult balance. That's a difficult absolutely. balance. One thing will be missing in this period going forward. In the previous Turkish-Russian engagement, what was creating crisis with the West, the fact Turkey engaged in defense industry cooperation with Russia, buying the Russian S-400, that was the major crisis, and that was the novelty, the geopolitical cooperation, and then the purchase of the Russian defense item. I think that will not happen in the next period, particularly if the U.S. and Turkey resolve the S uh, S400. Uh, sorry, if the U.S. and Turkey resolve the F16 issue. I think going forward, if this issue is resolved, Turkey will be more mindful about not engaging defense industrial cooperation with Russia. But if this doesn't happen, given Turkey's economic needs at this stage, because the economy will very much define Turkey's foreign policy at this period, from whom Turkey gets money, Turkey will be closer to that. And now the money comes from Russia, Gulf, and China. Let me ask you about the energy question, and I don't know who amongst you would most like to respond to this. Perhaps you, Demeter. How does energy factor into this? We know that the United States has really stepped up in terms of providing gas to Turkey, but Russia remains more important. Surely there are just natural constraints or there are material constraints on Turkey's ability to align itself in one direction or another. Or is there something deeply advantageous about being able to play this pivotal role? One thing we discovered with the war in Ukraine is that the energy trade is a two-way street. So it's not that only the supplier country has all the trump cards but also the, the countries on the receiving end, the, the customers, also have market power. And that's even more the case now that Russia is squeezed. Turkey has been using the situation to renegotiate and to improve the, the terms of the, of the trade. Now also Putin is uh, telling Ankara that it can become a gas hub, which essentially means buying extra amounts of Russian gas and reselling it. And it's, it's been a long-standing Turkish demand that the Russians were not prepared beforehand to, to honor. So uh, Turkey has fl- flexibility. It's not beholden to, to Russia. In good years, when LNG prices were down, you could see a shift towards US suppliers and others. I mean, Qatar is also a big supplier of LNG as well as a key ally to, to Erdogan. So it's a dynamic picture, but one novel element is now the nuclear power station, Akuyu, which is a major project that Russia implemented in Turkey. So Russia is becoming a key point on electricity. And also the, the other thing that has happened, and not many people have paid attention, that Russia is now the top supplier of oil to Turkey. Traditionally, it was Iraq, but now Russian oil is dirt cheap. And, and Turkey has a huge incentive to import more and more of it. Uh, so Russia became a top importer for Turkey in 2022. So yeah, I mean, it's a deepening relationship. Energy is part of it. But it's not like Russia is using the energy weapon, uh, quote unquote, to whip Turkey into shape and, and make sure that it, it tows the line. Uh, Turkey has lots of, of power and it's a much more of an equal relationship these days. Sinem, let me come to you on this broader question of 
the U.S. relationship with Turkey and how that is being affected by the war and by Turkey's very close relationship with Russia and certain dimensions. How do you see that developing? And does the election change anything? Or is this? Are, should we expect more continuity? Or is the more significant question perhaps the direction of travel in the war itself? I think what Galip said earlier, I would agree with that um, Turkey-US relations, but so will Turkey-EU relations, will be heavily shaped by transactionalism on the one hand and compartmentalization on the other. And about Turkey-US relations, first of all, I think those relations have never been absent of frictions in the history of starting from the late 1970s. But there is, I think, kind of a turning point in uh, the 2010s, and that has to do with what was happening in Syria. Now, the U.S. support or cooperation with YPGPYD in Syria against ISIS and Turkey's subsequent rapprochement with Russia, I think that's basically created um, not necessarily a rupture, but an important um, breaking point in the relations, which led two parties um, kind of um, decrease the mutual support, uh, mutual trust between the two countries. And I think the two things are different today in U.S.-Turkey relations. On the one hand, and as Aaron Stein wrote about this uh, last week in a piece on the war on drugs. On the one hand, U.S. is no longer supporting and strengthening Turkey as it used to during the Cold War. And on the other hand, it is also no longer um, as strong of an adamant supporter of Turkey's integration into the Western alliance. Think, for instance, U.S. was the main supporter of Turkey's EU membership. It was actually one of the main actors behind the customs union agreement of Turkey with the EU in the late 1990s. So those are all gone. That doesn't mean that relations will stop. Obviously, they won't. But I think they will not be free of conflict and tension. And into that, of course, I think the really strong anti-American sentiments within Turkey, both among the population, but also among government officials, which are often also voiced publicly. So I think those are kind of like structural issues that would continue tension in the U.S.-Turkey relations in the coming years. So let me ask you all perhaps a question about Turkey and its global reputation. There was that moment, which I think for Turkey was quite positive when it brokered the Black Sea grain deal that allowed Ukraine to continue exporting grain to the rest of the world through the Black Sea. Do you anticipate in these next several years of Erdogan's presidency, him seeking to embellish that role? I mean, there's been a lot of competition on the global stage for who can be the great soft power when it comes to beast diplomacy, when it comes to brokering new geopolitical relationships, humanitarian exits from Sudan, whatever it is. What role for Turkey is? Is this a space I can see, Galip, that you have, you have an insight into this? Let's come to you first. I think the Turkey will definitely try to continue to have this multiple role in Ukraine, the geopolitical role, because the war is taking place in Black Sea. Turkey is there. Turkey is a major Black Sea power. The humanitarian role, Turkey uh, and with the UN cut this grain deal that was very important symbol for Turkey's soft power as being a major actor on the question of food security, particularly for the global south, and the Turkey engaging or working to facilitate the prisoner exchange between Russia and the U.S., which took place in Ankara. So the Turkey will continue to play multiple roles, humanitarian, geopolitical, diplomatic, but there will be, as you rightly put it, there will be more contention. Uh, we have seen now Brazil on the Lula trying to offer engage in this realm. The Arab Gulf states are trying to play such a similar role. Looking from the West, particularly Turkey being a NATO member, Turkey's position on the war in Ukraine and across to Russia comes across as abnormal. But looking from the global south or non-Western world, that comes across as the mean north. Turkey adjusting to new normal. Because it's not only that Turkey that is engaging in geopolitical balance. Look at the Latin American states, look at India, look at South Africa, look at the Arab Gulf states who are dependent on the US uh, security umbrella. To in this regard, actually, Erdogan represents, if not spearhead, a new trend in international affairs, which is basically the regional powers demanding more autonomy in their foreign security policy more activeness in the regional affairs and status in international affairs. 
And you see as a very similar narrative being adopted by Turkey, now Brazil under Lula. This is not a new non-alignment movement because in the previous non-alignment movement, it was not that they had shared discontent vis-a-vis the West, but they also had a shared vision of the international system. So Nehru, Gan- uh, Nehru, Nasser, Tito had to some extent a shared vision of international order. Erdogan, Lula, or, the, or uh, Modi doesn't have a shared vision of international order, but they have a shared discontent in terms of their status and place in the international system and partially grievances vis-a-vis the West. Demeter, really would love to get your thoughts on this. Turkey's status, how much does it matter and how can we expect that to play out in the next few years? But it's an old story. It really started in the 2000s when Turkey saw this role for itself in the Middle East as this uh, aspiring hegemon using soft power and the economy to build a new order. And the record is mixed. The Syrian war basically scaled down Turkey's ambition. But in other parts of the world, you see Turkey making a breakthrough. I think sub-Saharan Africa would be a great example where Turkey has done a lot in in the Horn of Africa and Somalia in particular. One difference I see between Turkey and the likes of India, Brazil, and South Africa is when it comes to Ukraine. Because, of course, Lula and the Chinese as well, and, and even Ramaphosa of South Africa, they want to be there and to have a peace initiative. But it's very difficult to tell what it is exactly they're offering and how much experience they have in talking to both Moscow and Kiev. In the case of the Brazilians, I mean, it was a failure to start with because they failed to engage with Kiev. Now, Turkey is different. It's in the region, as Gilip pointed out. It's there. It has skin in the game. And it has special relationship to both Zelensky and Putin. It's just that the time is not ripe for diplomacy because both sides think that they can win on the battlefield. But once the time is there, I think Turkey will capitalize. And one last thing is that Turkey has economic might. Uh, There will be reconstruction in Ukraine paid with Western money. And it won't be Indian or South African firms or Brazilian. It will be Turkish companies who have uh, long-standing records in the post-Soviet space. They'll be profiting. Sinem, maybe I can come to you on this. And perhaps you could also say a word. Uh, Turkey's search for status, how will it evolve? And how much does China matter to this? Does it matter to not only keep a distance or a proximity to the U.S. and Russia, but there must be something in there about China's engagement and with Turkey? Yes, it will definitely continue, Turkey's aspirations for searching for status. And I just want to emphasize, in addition to what Galip and uh, Dimitar were saying, that it's interesting because as much polarization Mr. Erdogan creates within Turkey, I think he's also quite successful in triggering polarization in the Middle East and Africa and even maybe Asia. Because if you look at the the so-called Arab street, for instance, you see that his election, re-election, as the president was perceived extremely positively in different countries. Um, And I think that has really to do with this uh, strong narrative that Ankara has been deploying that is kind of like, not only that Turkey has become a very capable country in terms of diplomatic mediation, in terms of its economy, even though, I mean, obviously the country is now uh, developing an economic crisis, but as far as the narrative is concerned, it, it also fights the so-called, quote-unquote, imperialist actors. So this kind of anti-imperialist, third-worldist narrative, I think, has some sort of like appeal to the the masses across the Middle East and Africa. And in that sense, I think um, that's one dimension why I think the the search would um, will continue. When it comes to China, I'm not a China-Turkey expert, so my knowledge will be limited, but what's... Um, from kind of like based on my very novice reading of the relationship, I would say that it is mostly economic. Um, China has become over the years, of course, uh, one of the most important trading partners of Turkey. And Turkey imports mainly goods from China and has also been encouraging China, for instance, to use the Middle Corridor as part of its Belt and Road Initiative to position Turkey as a logistics and energy hub. So in a way, um, I think that's kind of like how um, Turkey sees relations with China. And interestingly, despite, for instance, Mr. Erdogan's claim and aspiration to position himself as the leader of the Sunni world, Turkey has been quite quiet when it comes to the suppression of the Uyghur Turks in China. And I think that has to do with those economic calculations in relations with China. 
I wonder, often the perceived absence of expertise is a reflection of the state of a relationship. And I wonder if over the next several years, there will be more and more experts on the Turkey-China relationship. It seems almost inevitable. Perhaps, Galip, you can give us a final comment on that. Absolutely. I think right now, the Turkey-China relationship is not as developed as, let's say, Turkey-Russia relationship. So one reason that the expertise is lacking because the level of development in this relationship is still relatively uh, low. In a new period, uh, the, the two things will define this relationship, as Sinan put it. One of them is Turkey's economic needs. Uh, the economy will be one of the major defining factors of Turkey's foreign policy going forward, because Turkey is currently experiencing a severe economic crisis. And from wherever Turkey can find money, it will have to be nice to them. And this money right now is in the Gulf, in Russia, and in China. So that will be one of the uh, one of the factors. The second one, however, the structural factor is again, as Sinan put it, is the Uyghur question. The Erdogan has been absolutely silent on the China's repression of the Uyghurs, but nevertheless, the anti-Chinese sentiment and pro-Uyghur Uyghur sentiment is very prevalent in Turkey. And at a time when the Turkish nationalism is a rising currency in Turkish foreign policy and Turkish politics, that would inevitably bring forward, bring, uh, bring forward the question of Uyghur for, uh, on the agenda of the government in one way or, uh, or another. So now in the next phase of Turkish foreign policy, the idea of Turkey for is gaining more currency in Turkish foreign policy. The Turkish nationalism is a rising currency. And historically, that puts Turkey on a collision course with Russia, China, and Iran. And we will be seeing these interesting dynamics going forward. That's an intense place to be. Let me come for a very final comment to you, Demitar, and then we will bring this to a close. We've had lots of background, which I think is symbolic of the country and the region that we're talking. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be Turkey. It wouldn't be the Middle East if everything was perfectly quiet, I don't think. Well, one thing on China is that Turkey imports a lot from China, but doesn't export much because China is protectionist and Turkey has many other trading partners of, of China is switched off from, from the market, not to mention procurement. So it's not a level playing field. The way Turkey enters the Chinese market is very often through Europe because supply chains very much go through manufacturing hubs in, in, in Western Europe, which basically brings us back to our conversation that despite this aspiration to be an independent power, some of the geoeconomics around it, but still tied Turkey to the European Union. If you look at uh, exports, I mean, more than 60%, uh, sorry, 40% goes to, to the European Union. This is where investment comes from. And if you have to deal with China, probably you have to bend up with, with the Europeans. Well, that's a very interesting place to, to land at the end of this weekly podcast. Thank you very much, Dimitar, Sinem, our own Galip. That has been a very complex, very rich, very storied conversation. And we will all be watching Turkey and its foreign policy in the days, weeks, and years ahead. Thank you very much. And that's the show. A big thank you to all our guests, Galip Delay, Sitnem Adar, and Dimitar Betchev. Do follow them all on Twitter. The links will be in the show notes. A reminder that you can find all of Chatham House's podcasts on Apple, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms, as well as through our social media channels. So do like, follow, and subscribe, and please do leave us a review. To read more from our experts or to find out more about our events or to become a member, and we'd love to have you, don't forget to visit our website, chathamhouse.org, where you can follow the work of all our programs, including our Middle East and North Africa program. Next week, we'll be turning our eyes to the Wagner Group and its conduct both in Ukraine and in Africa. Goodbye from me, Leslie Vinjamori, and thank you for listening. 